Hello and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, In Blyden's Wake, West African Intellectuals of the Early 20th Century. Anyone who looks into African-American thought in the first couple of decades of the 20th century is bound to learn about the debate and rivalry between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. We've presumably made that clear over the course of the podcast's most recent episodes, but we haven't yet stressed that this conflict was noticed outside of the United States as well. One example of international commentary on the Du Bois-Washington debate can be found in a chapter of Ethiopia Unbound, a remarkable book published in 1911. Its author, Joseph Ephraim Casely Hayford, commonly called J.E. Casely Hayford, was what we would now call a Ghanaian. At the time, the British colony that would later become the independent country of Ghana was still known as the Gold Coast. Ethiopia Unbound has sometimes been acclaimed as the first West African novel, although literary critics and historians debate that designation given that its fictional elements often take a back seat to Casely Hayford's philosophical views. The book's light veil of fiction is certainly on display in chapter 16, in which the Du Bois-Washington debate comes up. As the chapter begins, we discover that the book's main character, Kwamankra, has traveled from the Gold Coast to the United States and has been invited to speak at the Hampton Institute in Virginia. The topic of the address is the importance of the foremost thinker of the race. Will this be Washington, a fitting choice given that Kwamankra is speaking at Washington's alma mater? Or will he boldly challenge Washington's leadership by choosing to speak about Du Bois? Neither, actually. The foremost thinker turns out to be Edward Blyden, and Kwamankra draws a contrast with those other two thinkers to make his point. The claim of Edward Wilmot Blyden to the esteem and regard of all thinking Africans rests not so much upon the special work he has done for any particular people of the African race, as upon the general work he has done for the race as a whole. The work of men like Booker T. Washington and W. E. Burgart Du Bois is exclusive and provincial. The work of Edward Wilmot Blyden is universal, covering the entire race and the entire race problem. This is an excellent, though by no means unique, illustration of Blyden's influence on the generation of West African intellectuals active around the turn of the 20th century. We've spoken before of Blyden's legacy, as when we considered his impact on the work of the Trinidadian thinker Frederick Alexander Durham in the early 1890s. Another telling example of Blyden's stature during this period comes from none other than W.E.B. Du Bois himself. In 1891, while studying at Harvard, Du Bois delivered a lecture at a meeting of the National Colored League of Boston entitled, Does Education Pay? In it, he refers to Blyden, using much the same language found later in Casely Hayford, calling Blyden the foremost scholar of his race. But what made Blyden so special? Let us return to Kwamankra's address at Hampton for Casely Hayford's view on the matter. Edward Wilmot Blyden has sought for more than a quarter of a century to reveal everywhere the African unto himself, to fix his attention upon the original ideas and conceptions as to his place in the economy of the world, to point out to him his work as a race among the races of men, lastly, and most important of all, to lead him back unto self-respect. Born in the West Indies some 70 years ago and nurtured in foreign culture, he has yet remained an African, and today, he is the greatest living exponent of the true spirit of African nationality and manhood. The themes of self-respect and nationality here begin to indicate what Blyden meant to Casely Hayford and to others like him. Recall that Blyden underwent a philosophical transformation, leading him to move away from an early concern with black political independence toward an eventual path-breaking emphasis on cultural independence. He began to celebrate African cultural uniqueness, placing it in the context of an ideal division of labor in which Africans would benefit from Europe's scientific advancement while bringing the gift of spiritual advancement to the world. His cultural focus reached its final form in the period of the scramble for Africa, that is, the rush to colonize Africa by European powers, that got underway in the 1880s and continued up until the First World War. Blyden came to accept, 
European colonial power as a reality and imagine what good might come of it. West African intellectuals at the turn of the century took over these same concerns and operated in Blyden's wake, but we should not overemphasize Blyden's influence. While Casely Hayford's own words make that influence extremely clear, his own thought needs to be understood also within the political context of the Gold Coast as a colony, just as much as it requires recognizing Blyden's significance. Let's begin with the circumstances that gave rise to the Aborigines Rights Protection Society, an activist organization that counted among its members Casely Hayford and two other thinkers of the Gold Coast we want to discuss in this episode, John Mensah Sarba and S.R.B. Ato Ahuma. The story of the intellectual and political accomplishments of the three is probably best begun with Mensah Sarba. He studied law in England before returning to the colony, and shortly after his return, emerged as a leader through his role in founding an organization called the Mfantse Amambuhu Fakou, or Fanti Political Society. Among other things, the organization promoted the relevance of traditional Fanti political customs to the colonial situation, making one of its most important results the publication in 1897 of Mensa Sarba's book, Fanti Customary Laws. This comprehensive study of Fanti legal norms was acclaimed by none other than Booker T. Washington as one of the most interesting books in regard to Africa which I have been able to lay my hands on. Around the same time as the publication of Fanti Customary Laws, a political crisis led to the creation of a new organization, the Aborigines Rights Protection Society. The society arose in response to the Crown Lands Bill, a proposal to give the British government much more authority over land use. Mensa Sarba appeared before the colony's legislative council to attack the proposed law on the grounds that it failed to show respect for the people's traditions. Later, a delegation was sent to England to argue against the bill in front of the colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain. The society achieved its goal, successfully killing the bill. Mensah Sarba's prominence as a leader continued until his death in 1910. The man who would become known as Reverend Ato Ahuma was born Samuel Richard Brew Solomon, providing an example of the European names common among many of the coastal elite at the time. He purposefully chose the African name Ato Ahuma as part of his enthusiastic embrace of cultural nationalism. Historian Robert July draws the following contrast between Ato Ahuma and Mensah Saba's characters. Where Mensah Saba was withdrawn and introspective, a man of few words, artistic, sensitive, and subtle, Ato Ahuma was an extrovert whose dominating Rococo personality was appropriately fitted in a massive frame and whose convictions were sustained by a dynamic prose style and a commanding public presence. Poised against Mensa Sarba's precise but colorless manner, Ato Ahuma performed in the grand fashion. This contrast between precision and grandeur is reflected in the difference between Mensa Sarba's legal writing and Ato Ahuma's work as a newspaper editor, a difference that helps to make Ato Ahuma's writing, like Casely Hayford's, more obviously philosophical in character, than Mensa Sarbas. Ato Ahuma was ordained as a Wesleyan Methodist minister, like his father before him, and edited the Gold Coast Methodist Times. When the Lands Bill controversy arose, he helped lead the charge against it through editorials in the newspaper. His outspoken journalistic activism resulted in the Wesleyans ousting him from his editorship. He moved on to edit other newspapers, including Gold Coast Aborigines, the official newspaper of the Aborigines Rights Protection Society. In 1905, he published his first book, Memoirs of West African Celebrities, which introduced readers to many of the stars of this very podcast, including Anton Wilhelm Amo, Phyllis Wheatley, Kobna Atoba Kubuano, Alauda Equiano, and Paul Cuffey. In 1911, the same year that Casely Hayford published Ethiopia Unbound, Ato Ahuma published his most fascinating work, The Gold Coast Nation and National Consciousness. It brings together some of his editorials from yet another newspaper, The Gold Coast Leader. From the very beginning of the book, Ato Ahuma displays a conceptual creativity that evidently, if not explicitly, builds upon Blyden's framework of thought. He proclaims it the birthright, privilege, duty, destiny, and honor of the rising generation to usher in an era of backward movement, which to all cultured West Africans is synonymous with the highest conception of progress and advancement. 
further pressing the sense of paradox here, he insists, intelligent retrogression is the only progression that will save our beloved country. Convincing his readers of the truth in this paradox, that moving forward means going back to what their ancestors knew and lived, is one of the book's main aims. It is, as he puts it in the title of the book's second chapter, The Difficult Art of Thinking Nationally. One of his most forceful statements of the point can be found in the eighth chapter, entitled The White Man and His West African Understudy. He argues here that the educated West African is a copyist to the pitch of profane excellence. At his most strident, Ato Ahuma decries this tendency of educated West Africans to strive to be like Europeans as something hideously unnatural. A black white man, he writes, is a creature, a freak, and a monstrosity. It is not his view, however, that progress lies in seeking to be ignorant of, and untouched by, all that is foreign. He describes the opposite of the imitative tendency as the thoughtful, judicious, and discreet young African, naturally versed in the principles of selection, who differentiates and discriminates between essentials and unessentials, who studiously rejects and selects, skips what does not concern him or does not correspond with his environments. Ato Ahuma's goal, then, is not isolation, but rather independence. This is why it is no contradiction of his general criticism of copying Europeans that he also argues that it is absolutely necessary for our own good and in the higher interests of our country, nation, and race that we imitate them in those excellencies that make for genuine progress and advancement. Returning now to Casely Hayford, he was first educated, like both Mensa Saba and Ato Ahuma, at the Wesleyan High School in Cape Coast, a former capital of the colony, before going on to Fora Bay College in Sierra Leone, where figures we have previously discussed, like James Africanus Beal Horton and Samuel Ajayi Crowther, were educated. Casely Hayford can also be seen as combining the skills of the other two Gold Coast intellectuals we've been discussing in this episode, as he was both a newspaper man and a lawyer. At the time of the Lands Bill controversy, he undertook significant research on legal and political traditions, research which informed his 1903 book, Gold Coast Native Institutions. It is a much broader work of history, anthropology, and political commentary than Mensa Saba's Fanti Customary Laws. Another notable feature of the book is Casely Hayford's focus on the Ashanti Kingdom. The Fanti people of the coast and the Ashanti people of the interior both speak variants of the Akan language, and it is Casely Hayford's assumption in this book that the Ashanti political structure represents the original and most developed version of this people's way of life. What may surprise the present-day reader of Gold Coast Native Institutions is the purpose of the book as set out in its preface. Casely Hayford proposes to defend the imperialization of the Gold Coast and of Ashanti on purely Aboriginal lines, leading ultimately to the imperialization of West Africa. From our vantage point, it seems bizarre and even shameful that he should support British imperial success in West Africa. To readers at the time, though, the phrase on purely Aboriginal lines would have stuck out as a kind of challenge to foreign domination. The Ashanti had only recently been conquered, and their territory annexed to become part of the Gold Coast colony. In that context, Casely Hayford's appreciation of the Ashanti political structure emerges as a defense of indigenous self-government within the sphere of the British Empire. Indeed, in a manner that we first explored with Kwasi Wiridu back in episode 20, we find Casely Hayford emphasizing the Akan political tradition's commitment to representative democracy, something signally lacking under British rule. Following Blyden, West African political thinkers took imperial rule for granted, but sought to reform this rule. They pointed to the wisdom and sophistication of African traditional culture, and to the suitability of traditional institutions for the pursuit of modern progress. A striking expression of this theme in Ethiopia Unbound is the identification of Africa as part of the East, not the West, and the treatment of Japan as a model for cultural nationalism. In the book's first chapter, Kwamankra is in London, speaking with a white friend, and he reminds this friend that Jesus came from the East and that he was born in Bethlehem and nurtured in Egypt. If this reference to Jesus' time in Africa is noteworthy, more surprising, and even confounding, 
is Kwamankra's treatment of the Buddha as an African antecedent while predicting the coming greatness of Africa. He says to his friend, Forgive me when I say that the future of the world is with the East, the nation that can in the next century show the greatest output of spiritual strength. That is the nation that shall lead the world. And as Buddha from Africa taught Asia, so may Africa again lead the way. Casely Hayford invokes Japan when criticizing the tendency towards imitation. The goal here, as with Ato Ahuma, is not to reject European culture completely, but to make wise use of it, synthesizing it with an African base. He writes, The Japanese, adopting and assimilating Western culture, of necessity commands the respect of Western nations, because there is something distinctly Eastern about him. He commands, to begin with, the uses of his native tongue, and has a literature of his own, enriched by translations from standard authors of other lands. He respects the institutions and customs of his ancestors, and there is an intelligent past which inspires him. He does not discard his national costume, and if, now and again, he dons Western attire, he does so as a matter of convenience, much as the Scotch across the border puts away when the occasion demands it his Highland costume. Japan comes up again in the final chapter of Ethiopia Unbound. That chapter depicts the year 1925, which of course still lay in the future at the time the book was published in 1911. In this imagined version of the mid-1920s, Kwamankra has become an influential world thinker and has participated in bringing about greater understanding between the races. As the chapter continues, though, this character, who was clearly always a kind of representation of the author himself, fades from view as remarks flow on the course of world history. After years of patient waiting and discipline, Casely Hayford writes, Japan has at length shaken herself free from ancient conservatism, and China is following suit. This reference to Japan's modernization is soon followed by the comment that, it is a remarkable thing that the date of Japan's political awakening has been noted to synchronize with the political awakening of the Gold Coast. Casely Hayford then reflects once more on the unity of the Akan people and the virtues of their system of government, as well as their ideas as expressed in common words and phrases, in anticipation of the concerns of the so-called ethno-philosophers of later generations. He concludes, Thus it will be seen that the Gold Coast people are as good an Eastern type, in some respects, as those of whom we have written that is, the Japanese. Lest we give the impression, though, that West African intellectual developments were centered solely in what we today know as Ghana, we will travel to what is now Nigeria to note some parallel developments there. In his book, Colonial Subjects, An African Intelligentsia and Atlantic Ideas, Philip Zaternak identifies three thinkers operating in turn-of-the-century colonial Nigeria who notably endorsed and popularized Blyden's ideas. James Johnson, John Payne Jackson, and Mojola Agbebi. You might be surprised that only one of those names sounds recognizably African, and actually Mojola Agbebi was born David Brown Vincent. As in the case of Ato Ahuma, Agbebi took his name as an adult, inspired by the rising wave of African cultural nationalism. The European names direct our attention to the origins of these men. Jackson was an Americo-Liberian, whose father came to Liberia as an emancipated slave from Maryland. As a young man, he moved to Lagos, where he eventually became a journalist. Johnson was what was known as a Saro, meaning that he was of Yoruba background but came from Sierra Leone, where Yoruba people liberated from slave ships were brought by the Royal Navy's West Africa Squadron. Johnson was thus born in Sierra Leone to parents from Yoruba land. Like Casely Hayford, or even more relevantly, like his fellow Yoruba, Samuel Ajayi Crowther, he was educated at Fora Bay. After training as a minister, he was sent by the Church Missionary Society to Lagos, where his religiosity gained him the nickname Holy Johnson. Agbebi was born in Ilesha in Yoruba land, but to Saro parents. He was based in Lagos from a young age, and he too was tied at first to the Church Missionary Society before becoming a Baptist and then playing a central role in establishing an independent church known as the Native Baptist Church. It was important to clergymen like Johnson and Agbebi that a commitment to Christianity was wholly compatible with the cultural nationalist goal of being true to African roots. Indeed, for Johnson, embracing African identity did not even require detachment from the Anglican Communion. 
he resisted the independence of the African church in that form. Attending the 1908 Pan-Anglican Congress in London, he delivered a paper entitled The Relation of Mission Work to Native Customs, in which he carefully distinguished between traditions that could not be even slightly tolerated by Christianity, traditions that should be allowed to die out naturally, and those which missionaries need not ever try to disturb. For example, he held that infanticide could not be tolerated, while at the other extreme, there should not be any meddling at all with naming practices, traditional clothing, and marriage ceremonies. The issue of polygamy he took to be a delicate one, as he believed monogamy should be held up as an ideal, but also that it was harmful to the cause of Christianity to exclude the polygamists from the church. Agbebi, though personally a monogamist, went farther than Johnson, defending polygamy as a rational and moral custom. He did so as early as a speech given in Lagos in 1888, but his most prominent defense of the custom would come with his address to the Universal Races Congress of 1911. At this landmark conference, Opposing Racial Prejudice, held in London, Agbebi would have naturally encountered Du Bois, who throughout his life recalled this as an immensely inspiring event. Du Bois even summarized Agbebi's paper in a report on the Congress in the Crisis, the NAACP journal that he edited. The influence of Blyden, who was too ill to attend the conference and would die the following year, is evident in the summary, which reads, The problem is twofold. The task of Europe is to establish its political dominion and an industrial and commercial development. For the African, the problem is to see what effect the contact with the whites will have on his life, modified and attached in its essential features by this contact. European colonization would only gain by a more intimate and sympathetic penetration of these races whose civilization is so different. They venerate ancestors and heroes, cultivate secret societies, practice polygamy without grossness, as is common in Islam, and show certain superior characteristics even in their witchcraft, human sacrifices, and cannibalism. As this summary indicates, Agbebi went so far in his address as to locate rationality in the kinds of practices that Johnson insisted were simply intolerable. Not that Agbebi himself would ever have participated in, say, ritual cannibalism. He was in fact a vegetarian, and encouraged Christian converts to abstain at least from eating pork. Yet, in his address, he remarked, perhaps even with a provocative grin, human flesh is said to be the most delicious of all viands, superior in culinary taste to the flesh of either bird, beast, fish, or creeping things. This looks like a case of taking Blyden's logic to its extreme, but is philosophically instructive for that very reason. African tradition was taken to be a firm foundation for modern progress, which did not mean preserving each and every custom, or refusing to learn from Europe, but it did mean seeing traditional customs through newly appreciative eyes, and rejecting the label of savagery even where one might be most tempted to apply it. As Jackson wrote in one of his editorials, inspired by Blyden, it is now seen that the only useful course is to stimulate the people to civilize themselves, and the native of West Africa should employ the stimulus of European civilization to civilize himself, by ameliorating and advancing his own methods and institutions, remembering always that artificial life, however brilliant or promising, perishes with its possessor. West African thinkers in this period were not satisfied to choose between European and African culture. They wanted to have the best of both worlds. In keeping with our own effort to cover the different cultural spheres in which 20th century Africana thought unfolded, we'll next be crossing back to the United States, not unlike Kwamankra going to speak at Hampton. Our subject will be early African-American socialism, which, as we'll see, involves several immigrants from the Caribbean. Taking inspiration from Marxism, such figures as Hubert Harrison and A. Philip Randolph explored the question of how racial oppression is linked to class oppression. You have nothing to lose but your chains, and about 25 minutes out of your day, by joining us to hear all about it next time here on The History of Africana Philosophy. Thank you.